Hast du irgendwelche Apps auf dem Handy, die dir das zum Beispiel erleichtern? El Google Maps para cuando vas en bicicleta o en patinete llegar al sitio. Also die, die Stadtrad-App zum Beispiel. Ja, ansonsten habe ich einfach mein eigenes Rad. Äh, ja, nee, sonst HVV-App. Sí, sí, con la bicicleta tengo el Smooth, que es del Bicing. Ja, die HVV-App und ja? die Deutsche Bahn-App. Hast du noch andere Apps, die du so benutzt für die Mobilität? Äh, nein, tatsächlich nicht. Wie ist deine Erfahrung bisher so mit den Apps, die du jetzt benutzt? Also, dass die Deutsche Bahn nicht verlässlich ist, ist kein Geheimnis, aber mit der HVV-App bin ich sehr zufrieden. I to, že jako se nebudu vypouštět tolik ty, ty emise do toho. Šehir dışına gideceğim zaman bilet almakta kullanıyorum ama şehir içinde hiç e, uygulamalardan bilet aldığım veya böyle para yüklediğim vesaire olmuyor. To já vůbec nepoužiju, já si koupím jako třeba jako litečku nebo jako průkazku na městskou dopravu a jako tyhle nějaký e aplikace jako nebo to vůbec neznám nebo to mi těším poprvé jako. So hello everyone and welcome to this uh, this session uh, which will explore the journey of uh, an urban mobility entrepreneur and especially in these uh, COVID-19 times it can be very challenging as well and uh, we've invited a number of uh, startups that are part of our programs to participate and uh, to contribute with their insights of course and uh, I expect it's going to be very interesting for all of us to hear. So, um, I'm Frederick Hannell and uh, I'm the Business Creation Director at EIT Urban Mobility. So, where does all this fit in? Well, EIT Urban Mobility is pretty much focused around, I'd say, the cities and the requirements and the requests of cities looking at innovations and uh, education programs and also business creation activities. So where this, the business creation activities and the startups fit in is pretty much depending on the needs of the cities around Europe and the attached uh, countries that, we, that are members of the ITL mobility. So what is a startup? to start with and what is business creation? Well, business creation, I'd say, is pretty much helping, looking for groups of entrepreneurs and helping them in achieving success in their, in their venture. And of course, this has been going on for a long time, these kind of activities. Um, I think that one of the major tasks of business creation is, is of course to prepare these companies and the ventures and the entrepreneurs for future funding. Many startups need funding in going forward. So far this year we have um, a number of different programs that pillars that we run within business creation and um, We've had 401 applications for the 73 spots in our programs. The accelerator programs are focused pretty much on uh, startups, more early stage companies uh, have supported 38 startups this year. And that includes the COVID-19 startup uh, accelerator with, that was focused specifically on addressing the pandemic issues. Looking at the scale-up hub, we've supported 15 scale-ups with the purpose of, uh, of helping them interface, of course, with the cities and providing support for pilots uh, to the company. Last but not least, we're running uh, the Go Global program for 20 uh, startups and scale-ups, uh, some of them being uh, as far as away from South America. Uh, who want to enter the European market, but also 
European, our own startup community that wants to address uh, the, the ecosystem in Silicon Valley this year. And last but not least, we've invested in 13 companies. So of course, there are a number of city challenges and uh, that it has been the pre-requirement, the prerequisite for selecting startups to our programs. Um, these are in different ways. We're streamlining different programs in order to address certain of these aspects, of course. Um, but as you see, it's been a wide variety of different focus areas for the startups. So one of the first areas that companies may address is active mobility. It's pretty much, uh, I'd say, bicycles and walking. So it may sound very low tech, but actually there are some high tech solutions uh, like, um, you know, um, Everything from small cargo wagons that are AI steered to adapt to the way you bicycle, that you can connect to your bicycle to, to transport heavy loads. Everything from that to actually nicely designed new kinds of uh, bicycles and, uh, well, not many innovations on the pedestrian side yet, but we'll see. In sustainable city logistics, of course, uh, the last mile logistics and delivery of goods in the cities is uh, a big area where, of course, there's, there, there's a lot of opportunities for innovations and also it does cause a lot of pollution as of today. And one of the startups that we're going to be listening to today, Vonzu, has solutions that address these problems. Intermodality is another sector where we're looking at solutions uh, to be able to commute and be mobile within the urban areas uh, and use different kinds, different modes of transport in moving. And Vianova is one of the companies that, uh, that we will be listening to today around this. Creating the public realm is pretty much about I'd say reclaiming the streets, if I want to, 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 to use a, a movement word, but it's the 15 minute city. It's the super blocks of uh, Barcelona, where basically the citizens regain some of the urban space that is in their neighborhood and uh, where all facilities should be accessible within 15 minutes travel for the citizens. The mobility infrastructure, you know, it, one might think that this area is, is about 5G. And of course, 5G might be a big contributor to it. It's yet to be deployed. I think that what we've seen, though, is that uh, many mobility solutions for the cities are being deployed with other kinds of um, sensor technologies and uh, radio technologies like uh, LoRa and other technologies like that. Future mobility, it's very um, fitting here that we have D3 technologies uh, on this panel. Um, future mobility is, is of course uh, as well about, uh, you know, things like, uh, I'd say mobility in, in airborne mobility in the cities. It can also be new types of technologies to, to optimize uh, the transport and the transmission uh, of, um, of information within the cities. Mobility for all has been a quite hot area within, um, of course, the COVID crisis. Uh, because, for example, there is a need to, to optimize travel and optimize routes for people in high risk groups. Uh, this is, of course, also applicable for children or disabled people. They should be able to access all the facilities in the city. Uh, and there are a lot of innovations that can contribute to help them do that. Of course, electric transport, electric mobility, and electric solutions uh, are uh, 
very applicable as well. It's reducing, um, of course, reducing pollution, uh, but it's also challenging. And here, Elon Road is one of the companies we have on the panel today who addresses these kind of problems. And last but not least, pollution. So how to reduce congestion, how to avoid to spend too much time driving around in the city, for example, looking for parking spots, which is uh, the focus area of uh, eParkamat solution. So, of course, one might take a step back and think about the COVID crisis and uh, what kind of implications this has had on the, uh, the innovations and the situations for startups within the cities. And um, I think this can be a little bit telling. It's a you know, comparative picture of uh, you know, the, uh, the, the nitro dioxide emissions over Northern Italy before and after the lockdowns. And as you see, the lockdowns, of course, did cause a significant reduction. Why? Well, for example, Turin. Turin has changed dramatically because what they did was they, because of the lockdown, they noticed that, well, there is an opportunity to move from car transport uh, and to reduce um, uh, congestion by installing 300 kilometers of bike lanes and reducing the speed limit to 20 kilometers per hour. So if this is permanent or just a tactical move from the cities, that remains to be seen. But the fact with this is, of course, that um, it may mean for the startups that address urban mobility that there is a huge problem in the sense that the biggest effects created uh, by the cities uh, on congestion and improving the urban space for the citizens are quite low tech, quite easy measures to do. Um, and thanks to COVID uh, or due to COVID, there is uh, some understanding within uh, for the citizens and also the commuters uh, that these measures measures need to be taken. So this is a little bit to set some of the scope and some of the questions that we'll be asking to the panel. Um, but I'll thank you for now. And with that, I. I wish to introduce uh, the next company, which will be uh, D3 Technologies and uh, Corbin. Thank you very much. And I'm going to share my screen with you right now. So again, my name is Corbin. I'm the CEO and co-founder of D3 Technologies AG. Um, I'm an aerospace engineer by trade and have had the good fortune to manage several aircraft manufacturers during the course of my career. Learning from the limited audience that we sold aircraft to, I made it my mission to allow a larger demographic to benefit uh, from the concept of flight. In order to achieve this, um, air traffic control needs to be rethought from the ground up and I've co-founded D3 to tackle this exact challenge. Um, as mobility experts, um, most of you uh, have a, a feeling for the fact that urban air mobility will be coming um, at least to um, a certain number of cities and quite likely earlier than many people think. Um, the world is preparing for this new mode of transportation. Um, the exciting development of air mobility does add a number of serious uh, challenges that um, D3 is taking care of. How to make sure that this development benefits society as a whole. How to prevent early mass mobility actors from grabbing cities airspace and ensure fair access by all interested parties. And importantly to us, how to manage a large number of vehicles safely and responsibly at a scale that classic air traffic control was never intended for. D3 is busy designing, 
and uh, building a system that effectively solves these challenges. It is based on the concept of automated distribution of safe air routes and mechanisms to ensure adherence to these routes. It is safe and certifiable. It allows cities to maintain control over their airspace. Who are we? We have assembled a team of senior avionics, air traffic control and commercial experts supported by a young and capable engineering team and globally experienced advisors. We have generated engineering traction with the D3 Simulizer, an engineering tool that allows us to validate our development in a simulated virtual urban environment and allows us to visualize our system approach and communicate the impact of urban air mobility on cities. Our roadmap to automated urban flight includes exciting milestones. We are particularly excited about the beginning of our flight test program in Q2 of 21, in which we will demonstrate an integrated functional chain of ground situation, station, communication backbone, and airborne electronics. We expect a rollout to model regions as early as 2023 and first operations in 24. We as D3 benefited from being part of EIT and we're looking forward to sharing any kind of information and opportunity with all the panel and everyone who's interested in cooperating with us. Thank you for the moment. So thank you very much, Corbin. So, um, uh, so uh, I have a small question to you before we proceed. Um, obviously your solution depends on the advent of urban air mobility. And it may seem that that's quite a, quite far away as of now. How do you manage the uncertainties, both in market development and uh, the business model, when the market hasn't yet materialized? Um, quite obviously, that's a key question that as, as a young company, we um, spent a lot of thought and energy on. Um, we decided to take a deep breath and be honest about what we're doing. Um, we are a deep tech company that relies on heavy investment in order to realize our dream. Um, we decided that um, we would communicate to our investors that we will not bootstrap. In other words, um, we will not um, build our development from incremental revenue from earlier development, but that we would actually um, prove on a milestone basis the capability that um, we need to show in order to be um, relevant um, and um, justify investment um, through proof of capability. Um, I understand that that is not an option that is available to every idea, but is it, it, in, in our particular case, it was the only opportunity that we saw to actually tackle a, um, a challenge of this magnitude. Interesting. And I, I, I suspect that, I mean, obviously the profile of the team and uh, your seniority in the team is one of the key factors to actually investors being attracted to this in spite of the fact that, you, I mean, the first profits are quite far away. Um, I, I believe you're right. I, I think there are two elements to this. It is vision and execution. Um, both need to be there. Um, and quite frankly, they have to evolve as you go through funding processes. We're mm -hmm. in a fairly early stage. Um, we have just closed what we call a seed round, but um, we can already see that investors are even then looking for evolving visions and evolving ability to execute. So we actually have to build um, MVPs that keep investors happy and prove that we are executing on the vision. So um, we are expecting um, to, um, we, we actually have to prove what we're saying we're doing. And that's an interesting challenge, quite frankly. Yes. I understand that. Thanks. So uh, I think we're going to move on to the next panelist. Uh, that's Pavel from uh, ePartkuma. 
So welcome, Pavel, and I'll leave the floor to you. So thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I will share the presentation. So uh, we are eParkomat, and I am Pavel Verba, CEO and founder of uh, eParkomat. What we do, uh, we are working with parking because as I see, it's one of the biggest urban mobility challenge at this moment. And be honest, after six or seven years in the smart city area in, uh, in, in the mobility area, I don't know any bigger city without parking problems. That's a real issue all over the world. Of course, there is a lot of solutions which are available on the market for a longer time. Most of them are based on the hardware technology it could be a camera or some kind of the sensor, or the municipalities are trying to build some mobile apps which are acquiring the user's data to be able to solve, uh, to, to solve this problem. Anyway, uh, most of this solution is just uh, the part, part of uh, the solution which is necessary because they are solving just small areas, just a small part of this parking problem. Our approach in eParkomat is different. We believe that the data are the main factor of the success to solve the parking problem. And the parking is process because even you have the sensors on the street is usually uh, ending like this. When you are looking for the parking spot, you simply cannot find it. So uh, our approach is based on the data from the mobile operators. We are utilizing the anonymized data, which are telling us the position and some kind uh, of the behavior of the people. And uh, we, are, we are working with the data from whole countries. So we don't need any additional hardware. We have really high accuracy. And of course, this kind of the service has the global potential. Uh, from our point of view, the parking process starts not in the moment when you are looking for the parking spot, but the parking process starts when you are at home and you have your task, what you need to fulfill during the day to go to work, to go shopping, etc. From our point of view, we are making the real-time parking uh, analytics for the whole country. Here you can see the Czech Republic. It's not a simulation, it's the real product which is available uh, on the market for uh, for three years, uh, that's our uh, that's how we look on the city itself. Is the municipality of Prague, which is more than one million of inhabitants, and every day is coming uh, about six hundred thousand people inside the city. And this is parking situation how we are able to recognize it on the street level. So that means that we are uh, able to provide the data about the high level to the lowest level uh, in regards to the uh, parking situation. This is, uh, this is something what is used actually in the Czech Republic. We also made some pilots in Austria and uh, we believe that the data are a really key uh, of success. Why? Because the parking situation is not about the availability of the parking in this moment. It's about the parking policies. It's about the urban development of the city and readiness for the people and their needs. Uh, that's why a part of our analytics uh, and most important part is the analytics of the driver's behavior. We need to know what is their origin destination, what is, what is their final destination, what do they do during the day, why they are using the car, etc. Uh, this, is, this is something what is also covering more topics because as, uh, uh, as far as you have a data, you are able to uh, find the solution for different situations. We are actually supporting, for example, municipality of Prague, not only in the parking area, but as well in the area of the urban development, of the planning of the uh, public transportation. And we are helping to understand where is based the problem with the parking, but the parking is just the end of the process. We help them to understand why people are using the car to go to the city, why they are commuting within the city by the car, and what is the reason behind. Uh, that's what we do. Uh, we have uh, simple business models for that. Uh, we are uh, counting the, the area which is covered by our analytics 
and we can uh, provide real-time dynamic analytics to the municipality or uh, as well to the OEMs and uh, we are able also to make the one-time analytics. In the EIT project, we are, uh, we are making a pilot together with the city of Ostrava. Uh, there we are helping them to set up the dynamic pricing policy, which is based on the real-time information about the parking availability in the city. In regards to the COVID, we are really flexible because as far as you are working with the data, you can read what happened and what is, uh, what is happening and what is changing in the cities. And uh, you can dynamically change the situation to support uh, the people, for example, which needs to use their car to go to the hospital for the COVID testing. Because this, uh, this is the safest way how to do it to protect other people uh, from your potential diseases. So thank you for your attention. And in case you have any question, don't hesitate to ask me. Thank you so much, Pavel. Uh, actually, I, I do have a, a small question before we proceed. Um, I mean, of, of course, it's great to optimize the parking. And I think that uh, you might start to think how, how compatible is this solution with uh, you know, the super block concept and the, the 15 minute city where basically your business model accounts for, uh, you know, being paid for the number of, uh, I'd say, parking spots or, uh, you know, that you actually uh, manage to, to handle, uh, where most cities are actually looking to reduce the number of parking spots. So does that mean that you'll be out of business soon or what does it mean? <laughs> No, I think we are absolutely in the opposite position. Uh, mm -hmm. as, uh, as I explained, the data, uh, the value is not that we, we will uh, put some sensor on the parking spot. Our business model is about the data and about to help uh, to understand the situation to the cities. So we are already working with the uh, uh, in the area of urbanism and uh, we are supporting that solutions because uh, we don't think that it is necessary to have uh, like uh, more parking spots. Uh, we just need to understand the needs of the people, why they are using the car. Do they use the car because there is not available pu public transportation for them? Do they, car uh, do they use the car because they really need to commute intensively within the city? Uh, they are, uh, if they uh, commuting, uh, for example, from some part of the city to the second, where is the bad connection and where is uh, much more faster to go by car than uh, by some alternatives. And this is, uh, this is what we do. So my answer is that uh, we are fully aligned with this, uh, with these activities and we are supporting them because uh, we are from the Czech Republic, we are sitting in the municipality of Prague, which is really, really old city, when you can simply not uh, create new parking spots. But you need to understand why people are using the car, what are the alternatives, and help, uh, uh, help the city to understand and to design the new uh, approach uh, for the people, which, which will be uh, like comfortable for them and which will be in relation to their real needs. So uh, that's my answer. <laughs> yes, uh, thanks. I mean, it really does make sense. Uh, and and uh, I do think that what I really like about this is obviously that it's very hands-on. So you can actually see effects of your solution immediately. And that is probably a good sales argument when going to the cities and, and addressing new markets, I think. Okay, so... Um, the next panelist, the next uh, startup up for uh, presenting themselves is um, Thibault and uh, Villanova. So um, I'll leave the floor to you, Thibault. Thanks a lot, uh, Frederic. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Thibault, uh, co founder and CEO of uh, Villanova. And uh, Villanova is um, the data platform uh, to regulate uh, future mobility uh, on uh, city streets. So uh, we see ourselves as the traffic control uh, tower uh, of uh, urban mobility. And basically uh, what Vianova does is uh, we use connected vehicles uh, data uh, to help cities and uh, mobility operators build safer and uh, more, re more resilient and efficient uh, streets. So as, uh, as you may know, uh, there, there has been an explosion of new mobility uh, services 
in the past uh, 10 years that uh, of course brought some uh, benefits uh, to, uh, to travelers, but uh, also uh, some uh, chaos on the city streets. And now, uh, the, uh, now cities are looking um, to, uh, um, to, to answer these uh, challenges uh, brought uh, by uh, these uh, new mobility uh, services. Uh, since all these mobility uh, services are uh, competing uh, for the same and uh, scarce uh, public uh, space. So, uh, Vianova, uh, we uh, act as a trusted third party uh, data platform uh, between uh, cities and uh, mobility uh, operators uh, in order to facilitate uh, data sharing. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, we were going to uh, collect. Uh, data from uh, various kinds of uh, commercial fleets, uh, such as micro mobility, ride hailing, uh, last mile uh, delivery uh, services. And uh, we will uh, help uh, public authorities, uh, such as uh, traffic management, uh, infrastructure owners, uh, public transport uh, operators, um, to uh, better understand and better communicate. Uh, with uh, these uh, connected uh, fleets. So we, um, we, we are an open platform and, uh, and, uh, and we provide uh, open data uh, go governance um, to uh, cities and mobility uh, operators, uh, notably thanks uh, to the use of uh, open source uh, data uh, formats. Today, we are live in uh, eight uh, cities and we are working with uh, 18 uh, mobility operators uh, across Europe. Uh, and we supervise uh, 50,000 uh, vehicles uh, and uh, 2 million trips uh, every day. Some, uh, we, we, in the, in the past two years, we have uh, achieved uh, several uh, use cases uh, with the cities that we are working with, uh, notably with the city of uh, Zurich, um, uh, which we have uh, helped uh, enforce uh, their policies uh, regarding uh, the uh, limitations in number of uh, vehicles on the city streets. Uh, but we also helped uh, the city uh, create uh, new infrastructures uh, to uh, foster the usage uh, of um, decarbonized uh, mobility uh, um, services. Uh, so for instance, uh, thanks to our platform, uh, the city of uh, Zurich uh, created a certain number of uh, new cycling lanes and dedicated uh, parking areas. Another use case that we are implemented with the city of Brussels uh, is um, we helped uh, the, uh, the city uh, to create uh, geofenced uh, zones uh, in the city in order to uh, either forbid uh, the parking of uh, these new vehicles or uh, to uh, restrict uh, the circulation of uh, these new vehicles. Uh, this also helped uh, the, uh, the city uh, to more efficiently uh, report infringement and to reduce uh, the use of uh, enforcement uh, patrols. So uh, thanks uh, for, for listening and uh, I'm uh, available uh, if you have any questions. Great, thanks Thibaut. So um, uh, yeah, I really like your solution and you've got some significant traction, I must say. Still, I, I think that, I mean, from from the outside, one might perceive that there are many solutions that offer similar kind of services as yours. So what makes yours, your solution stand apart? And what do you think is key in, in your success in, in reaching this penetration so far? Yeah, sure. So to, to answer uh, briefly, I would say that what, what is key is uh, trust. Uh, trust uh, between uh, cities and operators, uh, of course, and trust uh, between uh, cities, operators, and uh, the third, uh, the third party platform that uh, that they, they might might use. So, what what what, what makes us uh, stand out uh, today? Um, first is um, 
high standards uh, in terms of uh, data privacy and data security. Um, um, and also um, the implement the creation and the implementation uh, of a very robust um, legal framework uh, between uh, mobility operators and cities. For instance, um, today in, in Europe, uh, we, are, we are the first platform uh, to have put in place uh, data processing agreement and data licensing agreements uh, between ourselves, uh, mobility operators and uh, cities. Uh, this, uh, this legal framework uh, makes sure that uh, there, is a trusted there is a trusted and secured uh, access um, to the right uh, data. Because of course, uh, the idea is not uh, to collect uh, data for, this, for, for the sake of it. Uh, so we help uh, cities uh, define the right purposes uh, that allow them uh, to collect uh, some of these uh, mobility uh, data. Thank you. I mean, yeah, that's really great. As you know, in, in Europe, not only because of GDPR, but many other things, we're very sensitive to the to the use of the, the personal data. Thank you so much, Thibaut. So um, I'm going to hand over to our last panelist, and uh, I'd like to introduce um, Karin and uh, Elon Road. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much for having us. Um, let's share my screen. So imagine a future that is fossil free and you can drive as long as you want with unlimited reach and you will never have to stop to refuel or recharge ever again. This sounds like a science fiction or fantasy, but it is happening today and we are building such a system. My name is Karin Ebbinghaus. I'm the CEO of Elon Road. And I would like to tell you a bit of why we are doing this and how it works. In Sweden, 30% of our total CO2 emission come from road transportation alone. And we need to address this issue in order to meet the Paris Agreement. And also we have the issue of air pollution. So if we can find a better way to solve transportation, both on highways and in cities, that would be preferable. And we have developed a solution that could solve these problems. It's a high tech smart solution that consists of an aluminum rail that you can put either on top of the asphalt or slightly embedded into the asphalt, preferable perhaps for motorways. It works uh, like this. If, if a vehicle comes driving over the rail, it will send an encrypted radio signal that the rail will identify. And if it's an authorized vehicle, the, the rail will unlock power distribution in very short segments of only one meter at a time. This means that we can charge both in motion with 300 kilowatt and 97% efficiency, but we can also charge when you're standing still. So it's a very flexible solution. It can be used both by large heavy trucks all the way down to small personal cars. So it's a very inclusive infrastructure. And besides charging, we have so much uh, processing power. It's basically a laptop every second meter. We have included a lot of sensors measuring uh, temperature, shaking, and in these uh, black lids you see here, not only do we have LED light that can give signals to other uh, passengers and tra um, transportations, we also have radar. So we can make better informed decisions to drivers, either if it's a personal uh, humans like us, or in the future, it might be autonomous driving. And here you see it works both while you drive and when you park, creating increased convenience and saving time. Here are some pictures of actual live projects that we are doing. So we are building one kilometer of electrical road to operate a bus line in Lund, uh, south of Sweden. It's uh, sponsored by the Swedish Traffic Authority. And quite recently, the Swedish government declared that they plan to build 2,000 kilometers of electrical roads in Sweden by 2030. 
but we also have a live project with the DHL having this stationary automatic park charger. And I know this is not a scientifically based study, but uh, at the terminal in Malmö, they have two electrical vans, one charging with cord and one charging with our system. And the driver who uses our system is much happier at work. So uh, this is also increasing convenience. And we have a technical feasibility study at a port in uh, Belgium to electrify their big straddle carriers, saving them time and money, not having to have really large batteries. And yes, we have tried it in snow. It's a quite common question we get. Even though we don't have much snow in the south of Sweden, we have uh, developed a special snow plow. And besides that, we have heating in the rail. And due to our temperature sensors, we know when to put them on or not. Well, our main benefit is that you can have increased range with very small batteries, and we will be connected and get, uh, generating data at all time, making transportation safer, smarter, and more sustainable. We're a quite diverse team, uh, consisting of different ages and backgrounds, but we have all come together because we have a firm belief that we need to do something about transportation and to save the climate. And if we can reduce battery sizes between 50 and 80 percent, we can have, we know we have a huge CO2 reducing impact. And we're really happy to get the opportunity to be part of the EIT Urban Mobility Network because we believe it's only together uh, you can have really big impact and change. Thank you so much. Thank you, Corin. So impressive, of course. Um, I mean, a spontaneous question is, uh, I mean, I foresee that there are a lot of infrastructure investments that are required for this to actually pan out and and obviously for you to become successful in the long run. Um, but do you think the fact that actually these investments are required, do you think that that actually puts you aside of the other electrical solutions that are out there and maybe even makes it difficult for competitors to, to come in and challenge you? Well, of course, there could be. There are some need for really heavy investment, especially if you're looking on the highways uh, on a European level. But it's also quite a decentralized system, and you could use this for uh, smart cities uh, only for an area if you want to populate uh, public transportation, for example. So here in Lund, we have calculated that you only need six kilometers of electrical road system together with the stationary charging to operate all bus lines. But if you have um, night charging or end station charging for buses that could only be allocated to those vehicles here if if you have this in the city you could have dhl topping up their charging during the day you can have taxis you could have several different kinds of vehicles and users so i i, I think it of course it's a an investment but it's quite the misperception that you need to electrify all roads for this to be uh, applicable okay Thanks. Yeah, it's a really exciting, as I said. Um, so uh, thank you all. Um, I'd like to open the floor actually to the first, uh, I'd say, open question to the panel. And that's specifically around, I mean, most of us uh, within the urban mobility space have to deal with governments, with uh, cities, with municipalities. and. I'm just curious as to how you perceive that interaction and how prone or interested they are in your technology. So I open the floor to, to you to reply. Anyone want to start? Yeah, sorry. Maybe I can start. So yeah, of course, uh, I guess everyone will, uh, will, uh, will agree um, that uh, we, we are on uh, long sales uh, cycles uh, when, uh, when it comes to, uh, to working uh, with, um, with cities. And on top of that, uh, very often uh, multiple uh, stakeholders. So on the one hand, you will have uh, the political stakeholders. On the other hand, you will have the business uh, stakeholders. And then finally, of course, you will have the technical uh, stakeholders. And, uh, 
bringing uh, all these people, all these people to the to the same uh, negotiation uh, table um, uh, can uh, can can be uh, yeah very very long and uh, and uh, and complex, uh, especially when uh, when when it comes to uh, to, uh, to 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 take a, a decision uh, on whether uh, to collaborate uh, or not. And uh, then there, there is a, a, another topic. Uh, since we, we are working with uh, with cities, uh, always comes the, the question of um, uh, taxpayers' uh, money. Uh, so, uh, we, which means that um, as an innovative uh, company, uh, we uh, always we often face uh, processes uh, where you need to go in a, in a tendering uh, process, uh, for instance, which can um, we, which can which can be uh, okay and which is fair but uh, of course when when you are a young company it's always uh, more difficult uh, to uh, to compete uh, uh, with uh, larger corporations uh, for for instance but uh, for, fortunately we and that's what we have seen um, uh, in the past two years uh, working with uh, several cities across Europe more and more uh, cities and also there, there is, a, there is a, some European framework around that. More and more cities are uh, putting in place uh, some, uh, some innovation scheme uh, that allow uh, startups uh, to, uh, to test uh, things uh, without uh, going into uh, a tendering uh, process. And that's very interesting, actually. And I guess that it's even more challenging when you have a solution that's Pretty unique in the market. So, you know, basically the tendering process is going to be streamlined to your solution if they want to, I mean, adopt it basically. So, um, uh, yeah, any other comments to this? Yes, maybe I will add the comment because I think the data driven business, especially in this B2G area, it's, uh, it's really the long term run. So, um, from our experience, uh, it's uh, really important to have the ambassador uh, inside the city, which is understanding, uh, which is understanding the technology, which is open to adapt to new technology, and what is uh, really important, which is able to convince all of the necessary parts of the decision makers or all the necessary decision makers about the benefits of the solution. Of course, the selection process, which is necessary for most of the business we do, it's uh, it's some part which is like uh, lottery <laughs> sometimes. As a young company, and especially when you are unique, you don't have a direct competitors. Uh, you uh, you are in the position when you really need to convince for the really small pilots for the start, which are like. Uh, accessible due to the risk and due to the um, due to the ability of the people involved people to to approve this pilot and then you can continue we have really we have really good experience that uh, uh, is really hard to achieve the first pilot but then it's much more easier to convince uh, uh, to convince the city to order uh, other and other services yes uh, and expand the service so the critical is the first part the business development and the convincing uh, the people uh, and having the right ambassador because uh, those guys needs to uh, really needs to fight uh, against the own people yes uh, mm -hmm. the way uh, of course uh, there are some way how to support them and i think eit is one of the tool which is really supporting the cities to make a decision to innovate. Because, uh, uh, of course, when you are bringing some kind of the budget for the cities, which is not under uh, the discussion of the tender or under, under some specific selection process, or you make the selection process as an AIT, uh, it's uh, much more easier to, for them to adapt, to prove, and of course then to, uh, to convince uh, the people around to uh, to adapt this kind of the innovation. I know that. Uh, thanks. I mean, I mean, in many startups, actually, you calibrate your pricing and your whole business model and the, the way you address your customers according to the decision process. So you make sure that the first step in, for example, is an easy decision, and then maybe you get into the account of somebody else within the company. So. But what do you think? I mean, um, 
Karin, obviously your solution as well is, uh, is dependent on the cities and uh, agreeing to this and wanting to implement it. Yes, of course, but we can see a great interest of cities solving these kind of problems. So there are different pilots. And, and as you said, the cities are uh, in control over their uh, streets and it's the traffic authority has for the national streets. But our system is also applicable for like closed loop systems for ports, mines or terminals. So we see that the same technology can be used in the private sector as well. And, and for a startup, it, it's really having both perspectives at, at the same time, you know, having this grand vision of what you want to accomplish and, and see the change in society but not getting discouraged that it takes a long time, but looking mm. at the small achievements that you, you win every day. Mm. Yeah, so looking at time uh, at the time perspective, I'm thinking of Corvin here, because, I mean, how do you, do you talk to the cities actively currently, or, or uh, how do you keep their interest up uh, before they have, are able to even test it or, or receive a demo? Um. That, that is a, a fairly tough challenge. Um, I totally recognize the statements that uh, Thibault, Pavel and uh, Karin just made in our uh, context too. Let, let me quickly back up um, a little bit. I, I see that the solutions that are offered um, answer different time scales in the problem um, space. Um, Parking is an evident problem that people recognize today. Um, the solution that Elon Road is offering um, offers a viable solution for something that is already manifested as a problem, recharging electric vehicles. Um, in our particular case, we are proposing a solution for a market that does not even exist yet. So I think we're a little non-typical in this regard, but having said that, um, I my appreciation is that um, due to various political and sociological effects, cities are very different in their uptake of innovation. Um, there are cities who are not interested. There are cities who are very interested, and I think a a huge uh, benefit to the startup community, at least in the European context, could be if one were to organize kind of a, a marketplace where interested cities could actually voice their interest towards the innovative community and also interest um, indicate their interest in becoming a model region for certain topics. Um, we're having, um, we are seeing a similar effect like, like that. Um, there's, there are certain regions in Sweden that are now um, uh, expressing interest in becoming model regions for um, air mobility. Um, Paris has indicated that they want to be a showcase for air mobility in 2024 for the Olympic Games. And that acts as a, a catalyst uh, for attracting ideas and for attracting um, communication between service suppliers and, and solution providers. And, and uh, that speeds up things uh, dramatically, especially when um, a, a, a development target is formulated. For instance, in Paris, they say, okay, we want to show a certain number of aerial flights, um, electric urban flights uh, by 2024, and then people can work on act actively work on concrete solutions. Um, so um, if, if one is talking about how can one support the innovative community, I think a, a great benefit would be um, to create proving grounds for initial projects. We heard that uh, mm -hmm. from, uh, from Pavel, Thibault and, and Karin. Um, that, that is a, a huge um, accelerator for any kind of innovation. Um, if companies don't only have to propose theoretical solution concepts, but can actually um, prove their viability in, in, in real life. I mean, this is great input, Corbin. And yes, uh, I think that obviously out of an EIT urban mobility context, this is of course exactly in line with what we will be trying to do going forward. And I think uh, looking at pilots, looking at um, living labs and any opportunity we can get to actually interbreed 
the innovators and the ventures with the cities and, and uh, the test beds is, of course, extremely valuable for the company, as well as funding, of course. I think. If, I, if I may quickly, if I yeah. may quickly add, um, the European Union had a tender out for so-called large-scale demonstrators uh, in the last um, 12 months. And uh, we analyzed the uh, participants in these tenders, and it's miserable. Um, it's basically only um, mega corporations who are taking part, and mm. this large scale. And basically, what what our part of the our scale of industry could use is somebody who actually puts together the efforts of who combines the efforts of startups to be able to make a viable offer. In, in these kind of large projects. And I would, I would be willing to bet the farm on the fact that a consortium of startups could provide at least as valid solutions as the mega industry can. Um, so, yes. um, and, and basically it needs someone with a tiny bit of public funding to actually integrate these solutions into a viable offering for these programs. So if, if you like the idea, go run with it, because I'm sure it's yes. going to be super valuable. I couldn't agree more, Corbin. Thanks. So uh, I'm going to move on to, to the next question, which is, um, it may seem a little bit controversial, but um, one might expect that because there are so many low-tech alternatives out there for cities today, it might influence the cities and uh, the governments and actually ultimately your addressable markets negatively because of COVID-19. So I don't know if you've seen any impact uh, in that direction or rather if you've seen increased interest as a result uh, of COVID-19. So maybe maybe I will, uh, I will start. Uh, Pablo, please, yeah. So uh, in the Czech Republic, we see we see the impact uh, because uh, together with the COVID nineteen, there is some tax reform, and uh, the cities and generally government uh, is getting less and less money. And unfortunately, some uh, some of the cities we see the trend now that uh, they are afraid to be innovative because they really need to choose the right direction how to spend the money, and. Uh, for uh, some of the politicians, there is uh, really hard to explain to the um, to the people which are voting them uh, why do they uh, spending the money, especially when uh, there is uh, like uh, no uh, no effect uh, directly. Yes, uh, if uh, if you are explaining that something happened in few years, for example, that you are using data to make better urban development uh, to improve the life in the city. For the people which are voting, it's not touchable immediately, and that's uh, sometimes a problem. That's a very good. That's a very good point. Any other comments from? Yeah, but I I, I share Pavel's view. I mean, you have I have individuals who are really interested of doing things and looking at innovations, uh, but then you have I would say a, a fear of doing the wrong decision and that you have to, to pick the right technology. Uh, and it's, it's more important not to do wrong than to do right. Uh, and that, of course, uh, restricts uh, innovation, I think. A little bit like nobody got fired for buying an IBM or what, you know. <laughs> Any other comments, Thibaut? Yeah, so, well, speaking of uh, making uh, decisions, uh, I must say that on our side, uh, uh, COVID-19 had quite a positive impact. Uh, on uh, on our business and uh, on uh, how we collaborate uh, with cities because obviously uh, cities uh, want uh, to make uh, the right uh, decisions and uh, what uh, we can provide them uh, is uh, the data driven tools uh, to make uh, these decisions so for instance uh, several cities that we are working with uh, used uh, our platform um, to uh, to um, uh, to, to, to figure out uh, where to implement uh, the corona uh, bike lanes. Uh, so, yeah. Interesting. I think there, there is a real uh, willingness uh, from cities um, uh, with the, this uh, COVID-19 uh, to, uh, to, to, to improve uh, urban mobility and uh, to make it uh, more uh, sustainable and more accessible for everyone. Thanks. 
So we 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 don't have that much time left. So, but Corgan, if you have a, a quick last comment to this, or well, again, from um, Thibault, I I totally recognize what you're saying. Um, I think you you have a, a a very fair advantage because you're upstream in the um, solution process. You're basically helping the city to make the right decisions, which is a great place to be as a marketplace. I understand that and congratulate you on that. But those who kind of need infrastructure investments like Elon Road or uh, we do, actually are, do depend on more than half of the city councilmen raising their hands at some point in the vote. And um, one of the big um, aspects of that is um, to have proven your, um, your solution at some point in time. And we're again back to the, to the same comment we made earlier that early, early proving grounds um, in the form of large or medium scale demonstrators for different trap mobility solutions um, would help innovation um, forward a lot. So I, I would hope that um, we hear more about that from the European Union too in the next um, few months, because I, I think, and I agree with what has been said in, in fundamentally, the um, COVID situation has increased the willingness of people to, to, go, to enter into some serious forward thinking. So mm -hmm. I think where we mobility guys are concerned, I think that in general, um, COVID did not disimprove our situation, but actually may have improved it. It's hard to say that because, you know, when people are dying, you don't want to benefit, but the 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 willingness to think about future forms of transportation has increased so yes so thank you so with that i think we have to unfortunately finish this panel i uh, i would like to invite uh, everybody who has been following this panel debate to actually remember that there will be a networking event where these companies and others are given the opportunity to actually um, mingle with you and uh, if you have ideas or projects uh, that you would like to implement with these or any of our other startups, of course, I mean, please feel free to reach out. So thank you very much for everyone.